Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming to the second day of the Four Years From Now Awards. It's a pretty amazing thing for the community. I don't know how many of you were here last year? Not a lot of you. So um, that was the Four Years From Now original founders. Um, so that was the first year, and it was a hell of a lot smaller last year for those of you that were here. It, it's been impressive building up to, to this and, and to the, all, everything you see here with the focus on startups. Um, this room right here for me is the most exciting of all, not just because I'm standing up here and, uh, and hanging out with you guys, uh, but because after last year, Mike, uh, Mike Chen, who's here and you'll be meeting in a moment, uh, the, the Mobile World Capital, um, and myself all sat down and said, how can we make next year even more awesome, even more exciting, even more full of exciting startups, and more importantly, people that want to help those startups grow? So, this year, essentially, in the Four Years From Now Awards and all the outreach we've been doing since August, um, Mike's been stuck here now, I think, for two months, uh, pretty terrible, uh, here in Barcelona getting ready, and we've all been working and going globally to find the best startups anywhere in the world for the Four Years From Now Awards. Um, and today, as you all know, is IoT Day, which is a particularly cool day for, for reasons that, that we'll discuss. So first, a little bit about the, uh, the three of us that have worked together, and more importantly, about you guys and how we've interacted together since August of last year to, uh, uh, to be here. Um, Mike is with Swell. Um, Swell is a corporate venture firm that invests and partners with startups and connects them to corporate innovation product projects. Uh, they've done over 40 in the last year. Um, that's a nice sort of tagline in Jardin, but at the end of the day, the exciting part about that, and you'll see that when you see the judges over there in about 20 minutes, um, is that Mike and people like Mike, people like you, the judges who are all from awesome corporates that want to engage with startups, engage with startups every day, invest in startups, want to help those startups grow, and that's what this community is about. It's an entirely new focus, and for those of you that have been coming to Mobile World Congress like I have for 10 years plus, um, it, it really is the most exciting part of all of this. This is the world we live in today. It's a world of startups. Um, Mobile World Capital, is dedicated, as, as you know, to putting things like this on and bringing the best startups in the world and the community of people that support them here. Um, but as we're here on the largest stage, right, largest stage startups, um, this is what we're working on building, um, the key part is not for them is not just bringing the best startups here for this week to come and hang out and, and grow, but also to make this a place that the best startups in the world come out of as well. Um, so there's all kinds of things going on there that um, that I encourage you to, to find out about elsewhere. And finally, uh, F Success, which I'll be the most brief on, um, is the global community for 100,000 startups and over a half million founders to grow. Um, and, and again, involves corporates and accelerator programs like Techstars and great people like Google and Microsoft that, that give them uh, growth fuel in terms of uh, free services, jobs, and so on. Um, so let's go ahead and kick over. Um, one, of the cores, one of the core parts of this event, as you'll see with the panel and, and the corporate leaders that will be on that in a moment, um, are the growth partners. And, and importantly, this doesn't say um, corporate partners, it doesn't say investment partners. The focus for everybody here is, is on growth and having the best, most active, most healthy startup ecosystem that we can in the mobile area. Um, I think uh, some of these have already resulted in relationships yesterday. Mike, I think we had a, a few startups in the panel that connected with judges, and there are actually deals going um, based on those conversations, um, which is quite exciting. So we have 24 finalists. For those of you that weren't here yesterday, we had startups that came in and disrupted by mobile, which is just the entire world, right? Everything's changing with, uh, uh, as mobile is this huge force that hits it. Um, today we're doing IoT, and tomorrow when you come back, we'll be doing digital media. Um, today we're doing seven top startups. You can see their names there. You'll find more about them later on during their pitching sessions. Each of them will have three minutes um, to, to talk to you and meet you. Um, every single one of these startups, and I'll talk about how we got them in a moment, 
has raised money. So these startups all had awesome ideas. They were all validated in the sense that they raised money. They all have traction. You'll see a bit of information about that in a second. Um, and it ranges from uh, Hanha, which has raised a seed round, to Sentience, which has raised in excess of $3 million. So it's, it's a great spectrum, if you will, of what's going on. It's also a good uh, range of B2B applications and B2C applications. As we look out over this market, um, where today we have about 9 billion devices connected, so that's, that's what we are today with all of our phones, uh, all of our computers, and, and just the beginning of IoT, um, the projection, which I think is quite low actually when you go and do the numbers about all the things you want to connect, is that over the next five years, we'll rise to 26 billion devices connected. So one thing I'd encourage you to think about as we go through each of these startups' pitches is how they'll play part of that revolution. And if you think about that, that's just another steepening of the curve we've been on since the internet and this whole web thing of connecting uh, phones and everything together started. Um, I'll run through this quite quickly. Um, the key point of, of, of these next few slides is, is very basic, which is Mobile World Capital, f success and Swell have scoured the globe for the best mobile startups. Uh, so the ones you'll see here today are the results of that process. Um, not surprisingly, lots of outreach in Spain, but we went really everywhere in the world um, and, and every city in the world, uh, throughout Asia, North America, Middle East, and so on. Um, as far as participants goes, these are the people that boiled down to who you saw yesterday, who you'll see today, and who you'll see tomorrow. IoT was a huge part of that. So IoT, we had a 129 entrants there. Um, for those of you that are active in this market, you know how much excitement there is, but also how incipient it is. There aren't a lot of startups providing solutions in the market. It's growing, and it's, it's growing very quickly. Um, but that's a, a, a large swath of, of the startups globally. Great sample. Um, and then by industry, even within this IoT track, we're seeing people from all parts. So if we divide uh, IoT and all the growth we're going to see from those 9 billion devices all the way up to 20 billion plus, um, we've got enterprise, we've got consumer roughly, and then we have government markets. We have people across all those markets that wanted to impact and change every single one of them. Um, on funding, I mentioned that we went for a broad swath. So those of you who are interested in, in getting to know startups that are early, in sta early on or later on in scaling, we wanted to make sure that the common denominator was that they would be the best startups, no matter what stage of funding they were on. Most of them are raising. All the startups today have raised. Many of them are still raising. So for those of you who are interested in the investment aspect of helping them grow, um, please come up afterwards and have a chat with them. Um, on revenue, we wanted to make sure we had a mix as well. Um, there is a lot of revenue in this market, and we're starting to see the leaders emerge um, often with the help and partnership with corporates, um, often by going directly to consumer. Um, we've got all ranges today as well there. Um, so last, without further ado, I'll ask Mike to come up. Mike will uh, lead us through a bit of a chat to get to know the judges. Um, and afterwards, I'll come back and introduce you to the startups. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sean. So that was an awesome intro, and, and, and thank you so much. So um, are, are we ready to meet the judges? Are we excited? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> all right, there. OK, so I'd like to invite all the judges. Please come on the stage, take a seat. Um, we might have to re rearrange the furniture a little bit, and, uh, and we'll, we'll go into a quick introduction so we can get to know the judges and what they're working on. Judges, I'm going to ask you guys to match the pictures on, on the slides, if you can, Antonio. <laughs> okay, so you guys will have to creatively match the judges on, on your own. Okay, great. So we're going to start with um, a, a, a basic question. Uh, so you know, all of you guys are in, in different capacity working on IoT. Um, I think for the audience and, and the startup that's presenting, it would be great for us to get a sense of what do you do? What are you working on? Why are you here? And you know, what type of uh, assets or, or support you guys are bringing uh, for the startups? How are you guys going to help the startup grow? 
And we'll start with, uh, let's start with Yves, because you're, you're, you're the closest to me. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Izzy Vidra, and I'm a general, par general partner at Google Ventures. And uh, while we have the name Google in front of the word venture, we're not a traditional corporate venture fund. We're a, um, we're a VC fund that, that happens to have Google as our limited partner. So we invest in startups and help them grow, bringing them uh, the access to the resources from Google, but also our own support teams, uh, which include design, recruiting, marketing, PR, etc. We have a little bit over two billion under management with over 280 portfolio companies, some of them in the IoT space as well, and we can talk about it later. And we are really excited to partner with the most ambitious founders that are looking to solve really large global scale problems through technology. And maybe I mentioned last sentence that uh, we recently launched a European fund and we have 125 million a year to invest in the top European startups from cities like London, Tel Aviv, Barcelona, Paris, Berlin, etc. So I'm really excited to see the startups today. Thanks again for having me. That's awesome. And, and Google Venture also, it's uh, worthwhile mentioning, also um, they, they do yearly infographic about the impact of the investment activities. Uh, so you guys should definitely check it out if you haven't. And uh, next one we have Martin. Um, can we talk a little bit about Cisco? Thank you, Mike. So very excited to be here. My name is Martin Pittner from Cisco. Uh, we, I personally have a very strong startup DNA. Our company got acquired by Cisco 20 months ago. And I have the honor to run the uh, Open Innovation Startup Acceleration Program for EMIR. Uh, we are based in Vienna, but territory is all EMIR. What we basically do as a corporate uh, incubator accelerator type, we take, uh, we scout startups in a continuous process uh, in the IoT, uh, security, big data, uh, so very close to Cisco what we do, but not too close so we could develop it ourselves. So we want to look out uh, maybe two to three years from now with our startups and work with them for six months and try to get them strategic. So there is no equity portion involved in the beginning. Uh, we expose them very much to customers and we have uh, a Cisco as a corporate very large customers. And after the six months, we both decide, the companies and us, do we want to get really strategic? The business units take it to your portfolio. Uh, of products and uh, there will be funding from our corporate development and we work with uh, venture funds then to uh, get you to the next stage. So very uh, excited to work with all of you and uh, yeah, looking forward to what we see today. And also Cisco has a, a newly announced IoT fund, right? We have IoT fund uh, <laughs> dedicated to IT, uh, it's 150 million. Uh, but as I said, uh, for us, it's more the content to get you to the next level. And then we talk about money because uh, money you can get uh, from venture capital, from uh, private equity, from us, from many sources. That's great. Thank you. All right, next up is Meg. So what is IBM doing here? Um, our strategy is quite simple. Um, we've tried to make it that way. So first of all, I'm ahead of futures um, for both solutions and technologies. And we've created a small division, and in my group, a small group, that we're just going to try to harvest what's relevant in the world, whether it be startups or otherwise. We look at things from a perspective of makers and users. People make things and people use things. And we've kind of divided our solutions underneath that strategy. For people who make things, they, there's things that move and things that don't move. And for things, people that use things, whether they be pipeline or heavy equipment or machinery, they're either trying to optimize that piece of equipment or they're trying to service it better or do predictive maintenance. So we kind of follow that tree down at a higher level from a solution perspective. For us, IoT, what's different is that the physical meets digital. And there's a device. And the device all the way back really dictates the behavior of the system. And so for us, it's really that whole every step along the way, whether it's a gate going through the gateway, going through the networks, going through the cloud, you know, coming back, and all resting on security as a, as a, as a tenant as well as analytics because all of the data that's collected really has to be processed and made sense of. And from a perspective, just to give you quantification, that statistic that was floated, you know, the 26 billion, which seemed low, just for perspective, that's 28x the world's population. 
So that number might not seem big, and it might seem like it should be bigger, but 28x the world population, that's a lot of things that are connected, and that means there's a lot of data coming off those things that are connected that has to make sense out of it. We really believe that this community that you sit in is our most rich, um, uh, really, prospects of the future. Um, Gardner published a study which we wholeheartedly believed, we had nothing to do with it, but we believed it, um, full, full supported, that by 2017, 50% of the companies in IoT that are successful will be startups or VC backed. And if you think about it, that's you. Um, we really believe that to harness this, we've created a development environment that in a community, an IoT type hub, um, innovation hub, where small startups and academia and, and big business can all participate and start to figure out what really matters. So we're excited to be here and really see what you have to offer because you're our future. Wow, that's awesome. So Antonio, um, I think you need to give a little bit of background about BK. Sure, no problem. Uh, so good to be here, guys. I'm Antonio. I uh, have a background as a, uh, an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. And uh, a year ago, I joined Billard Korsnas, a Swedish uh, company. We uh, do packaging material and packaging solutions. So we work very closely with uh, brand owners, and retailers, and uh, consumers, of course. And we try to add value through the packaging. So uh, as an example, we uh, worked with uh, Spotify quite recently. And what we try to do here, of course, is to, uh, I mean, re really interested in the space between di digital and physical, right? So Spotify obviously offer uh, something digital and the, in, the, in the need of physical uh, addition to that. And we are also looking a lot in the digitalization of, of uh, our pack packaging materials. So, so that type of interaction is uh, quite interesting to us. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, last but not least, we have Pierre from DHL. Uh, hi, thank you very much for having me as well. Um, Pierre Benson from Deutsche Post DHL. So we are currently looking at digitizing all the communication flows in and out of a company like Deutsche Post DHL uh, because logistics is inherently data, right? And what we are doing is we are together with startups like yourself, as well as partners, as well as established companies, um, finding ways to optimize and efficientize all our flows of communication, data, uh, exchange. That also includes things like identity, trusted communication, but also security. So recently we launched our own messenger, SimSme, for example, or we partner with a startup um, to do some semantic tagging, or we have also acquired a couple of startups, obviously, like allyouneed.com in Germany for food distribution. So we are, you know, there's a, a whole thing that we're doing, obviously, around the world. Um, you probably know about the company, but we're not all that small. So anyway, we are really looking forward to seeing all the startups today, and um, thank you for having us. Awesome. Well, Piri, you're not off the hook yet, so we're going to start back from your side and move this way. So I, so while on the topic of startup, I think it's, it's uh, be helpful for us to dive into you know, one or two examples about, you know, the, some of the future cases that you guys all mentioned that you guys are working towards and how by working with the startup that you guys have, you know, brought some sort of new uh, scenarios or new cases that, that, that have helped grow so, the business in some so way. So across the division, across all our divisions, we have four, four main divisions, right? We have um, our express, uh, we have our uh, global forwarding, which is big freight, and then we have our supply chain as well as we have what we call German post, or really is the post and pass on e-commerce for Europe. Um, all across all those divisions, we try to get time to market. Like in this market and in, in the digitization of the world communication and, and all our logistics, speed to, to market is key. And we are not able to do all of it ourselves. That's why we partner with startups and we partner with others as well. So it's not only just do we partner, but we also, rather than just investing money, we also give traffic right? and we give access to some of the, some of the key uh, business opportunities out there. And the reason why we look at an array of opportunities is because we won't do all of it ourselves. Um, I don't come from a logistics company. I, I actually come from the IT and the internet business. I have a very long background. I've only been with the company for a couple of years. But it's really important to see the combination. And this goes into what Meg and Antonio were saying. We are combining the digital with the physical world at real time. And hence, we didn't. For example, those of you who know in Sweden, we did My Ways, which was an initiative to try and find disruptive ways of delivering parcels.
So I was busy taking picture, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I would say that we're really interested in uh, embedded functionality. So we're looking at um, stuff like proximity technologies, anything from barcodes, NFC, RFID, uh, and so forth that you could uh, embed into your uh, smarter packaging material or packaging solutions. And that would uh, enable some services uh, through your packaging, right? You can do anything from track and trace to payments to interaction. So you pretty much use the digital world as a value add. So, you know, packaging is really all over the place. And uh, traditionally, the role of packaging has been to contain and protect the contents and also to transport it. And now we see a huge potential in, in activating you know, further uh, functionalities and services uh, uh, through that. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Um, so we look to your community for pure disruption. It's that simple. Um, we feel that we have certain patterns under those solution sets that we think go across, and they also are individual by industry or verticals that we're populating those solutions. We've created, as I had mentioned, this Blue Mix, in Blue Mix, which is our development environment, an IoT innovation zone for you know, startups and young developers to come, um, or new companies, new entrants, to come and participate with basic building blocks, composable building blocks, so that really you're able just to start innovating on your ideas and putting them together. You can be part of communities, so you can community share, or you can even be individually doing your own thing in an environment that's affordable to you and, and starts with freeware. So from that, why we want to do this is we feel that you will come up, you'll disrupt, you'll come up with patterns, you'll come up with patterns that support what we're trying to do. You'll really probably come up with a lot of patterns we never thought of um, for the verticals. And we think that that's really the, the real ingenuity that we want to try to harness. At IBM, you wouldn't look at us as really being uh, startup friendly, perhaps. Um, you know, we're definitely B2B and we buy lots of companies. And really in IoT, it's very different. The ecosystem is very big. It's very broad. The importance of partnering is key. No one can do it alone. Anyone who sits here and says they can really doesn't understand the space, perhaps, because I agree with you. And from that end, we need to grab a hold of the disruption and embrace it. And I feel do it faster. That would be the advantage for us to really capture what the market is suggesting versus what we're suggesting. Yeah, it's great to mention. So IBM has been doing you know, a lot of different programs, uh, such as uh, Smart Camp, uh, that has this global competition all over the world, and also Blue Mix um, with you can plug in a Watson now, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we'd love to hear from Martin um, how a Cisco approach um, with working with startups varies with um, somebody like IBM or Google, because obviously Cisco has been in the in the cloud space and and uh, in, 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 in networking space for a very long time. Yeah, maybe one question. Uh, I'm wearing a tie here. Who is wearing a tie in the auditorium? I'm the only one, right? So um, you might wonder uh, why I, um, I'm in here, uh, not startup dressed. Um, we just came off uh, a press announcement together um, uh, on the Congress, uh, together with Intel and Deutsche Telekom, that we want to take that to a new level, uh, this open innovation and acceleration thing. Uh, because we strongly believe in what we, uh, we are a pretty young program in, in Europe. And we did these entrepreneurs in residence. Uh, we started the scouting last summer. And uh, in this January, we uh, took five companies and uh, got on the journey for uh, six months with them. I'll give you an example. Uh, as, as you said, Mac, uh, so much data is produced out there and we can't store it anymore. Uh, if you would do it to a, a data warehouse in the back end, uh, it's it's way back, it's like looking in the mirror, which is uh, not good for business decisions. So we scouted a company out of London uh, with machine learning on streaming data, moving the data in motion, uh, which is great because they, they're coming from the stock market where they want to see before it's stored if the pattern of data is changing, which is a great thing for IoT, IOE, because you don't want to see the normal, you want to see the abnormal, right? And uh, we're taking them to cybersecurity, we're taking them to predictive maintenance, those type of things. Where do patterns change? Like a video camera, when it pops up, when someone is going through the surveillance camera, right? So that's what we, we do with those guys. And what we found, we are partnering very closely with a sales organization, because what does a startup need? Customers. 
access to global customers, great customers. And uh, we found that we have a different access to our customers than our Salesforce has. Because the innovation thing is owned by the C-level. It's a CEO thing that they bring the new, they care about the future, uh, they are on stage. So we get all these meet great meetings and we take the Salesforce along. And by that, we saw that uh, other companies are very much interested in joining this motion. So that's what we announced today, and I'll give you a quick overview about the process, uh, what we do with uh, Deutsche Telekom, Intel, and, and ourselves. So we start scouting and invite uh, all these IoT startups uh, uh, that might uh, adjust to our uh, businesses. Uh, Intel very much in variable in sensors, in robotics. Cisco on the streaming on the network. So we tap into uh, from the very edge of the network uh, to the UCS in the back end. Uh, and Deutsche Telekom having uh, two, uh, 240 million subscribers in I don't know how many countries. So they have a really reach to the market and can deal with the, the mobile uh, because the front end is mobile today. Uh, so we take applications, uh, we'll announce 24 companies uh, that qualify, pre-qualify on the Pioneers Festival in Vienna, end of May, and then take them to co-working with us a week uh, in Krakow. Uh, and all the executives of all three companies are there. And it was fun to see how they committed today. Like, okay, if you're there, I'm there as well. And they start networking amongst each other. So we're starting a change between the companies as well. And so we have them co-work the executives with the startups. And then we select 12. And then we incubate them for another four months with a target getting them on the uh, price list of one, two, or all three companies. So that's, that's the challenge we, we're doing. So excuse me for this. I'll take it off later. Very, very exciting. Yeah, that's a great announcement today with multi-corporate initiative. Is, I think I have a different question for you. So Google Venture has invested in some pretty crazy stuff, right? From, from, from 32andMe uh, to, to, to Uber that we all love and, and sometimes uh, uh, have to discuss about other times uh, to, to come to the NGMoCo. So um, what, what is your view on the future of IoT from an investment perspective uh, from, from Google Venture? Sure, so we think it's a fascinating area and uh, something that we're looking into actively. Of course, Google's big bets are in our DNA. So you may, have, you may be familiar with some of Google Access projects like Project Iris, the contact lens that uh, reads the level of glucose uh, from the tiers. And we've invested in companies like Nest, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and Savioc, a friendly robot for the hospitality and service industry. And what we're looking for is really for, to back the ambitious entrepreneurs tackling huge problems in this space with the ambition to really reach a billion people. You know, we're not looking for the local champion, we're looking for people that are looking to solve the problem globally. Um, I think you guys mentioned some really interesting trends in the space, like building a platform. You know, you're probably not going to be able to solve the problem yourself. So thinking about your idea as a platform and inviting others to participate uh, is something that excites us. Um, the making sense of the data is another area that uh, it's very close to, uh, to Google Ventures. So uh, another specific area that uh, maybe is not so known that Google Ventures is very active in is life sciences. So over 30% of our portfolio is life sciences investment. And I think that there's particular interesting applications of IoT in that space that uh, we're actively looking for opportunities. That's awesome. OK, so that will conclude that as a judge introduction. Let's give a big thank you to the judges. And uh, I'd like to invite Sean from XSS back up on stage. He's going to kick off the startup portion of the program. So, Sean. Full house. Awesome. So we're going to hear from seven startups. Each of them will have two minutes to share with you what they're doing. Sorry, three minutes. Um, following those three minutes, we'll have two minutes of questions from the judges, raw, uncensored. Um, so I, I wanted to start off right now with Atuma. Uh, Atuma is a startup that is fresh off winning a competition in Krakow. They're aces at winning competitions. Let's see how they do in this one. Atuma, please.
Thank you, Sean. So, shall I? Okay. So, hi, hi everyone. I am Luca. I am the marketing manager of Atuma. And what we offer is a white label solution to do Internet of Things automations. So, uh, this is not our first time in Barcelona. We've been here two years ago and we won for best application of the year, launching Atuma for Android. And this application we launched was very much like if this then that. So we deal with automations on mobile phones, but we are very much focused on mobile and Internet of Things devices, and we are very focused on the context. So we manage much more triggers, so if conditions and many actions. So we got a huge traction thanks to the MPA, and we won a lot of prizes. But at one time we asked ourselves, how come everybody loves what we are doing, but we are not getting the big money? So we realized that actually companies really like this technology, but they don't want to see a cool application. They want this kind of features inside their systems and their devices. So we switched perspective from B2C to B2B2C. And actually, who we are today is an Internet of Things company that is offering a white label SDK to be embedded into existing technologies to make Internet of Things ecosystem smarter than ever. And on top of that, we're also working on machine learning because we have this algorithm that is able to do behavioral analysis across different devices and then is able to suggest seamlessly to the end user a tailor-made use case that is based on how he behaves with those of these devices. So these are some of the companies that are helping us right now developing the product in different verticals. But now enough with the marketing, blah, 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 and let's talk about you guys. So listen to me. If you are a startup in the IoT field, you probably need more users or to sell more devices or more backers for your crowdfunding project. And we can help you with that for free because we also have an open source SDK, which of course is limited compared to the white label, but is related to the Android application. And if you build a new building block, like a new if or a new do for us, we have all the interest in pushing this through our community of 500K downloads. And we've already done this with Pebble and Flick, contributing to two of the most successful crowdfunded projects ever. On the other hand, if you are an IoT corporate, you probably need to face R&D, data analysis, data gathering, and also brainstorming on use cases and consulting. And we can help you with that with our white label solutions. So it's really an honor and a pleasure being here pitching to you at four years from now. We invite you to visit our stand just, around, just right of the exit. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Questions from the judges? So question I would have, what would be your dream customer for the future in really that could scale you? Well, we are, our business model is based on licensing fees. So we're really interested in uh, device vendors that have huge distribution. And we're already partnering with Samsung, so it will be really interesting to uh, deepen a partnership uh, with a huge device vendor like mobile vendors, but also wearable technologies, for example, Okay, thank you. You mentioned that you guys are, thanks, first of all, a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I don't understand how you guys are from Poland because you're both, you're both Italian. No, yes, we are based in Rome with R&D and we also are based in San Francisco for business development. Okay. Now, that wasn't my question, but thank yeah, you for okay. clarifying. Um, I wanted to know, like you guys mentioned that you're like IFTTT. Uh -huh. what, are the, what are the main recipes that your existing clients and your pilot customers are asking for? What's the, like, the use base case scenario for this technology? Yes, well, a lot of the functions are actually based on location and activity tracking. And uh, this is also why we are working with smart things. So it, it, it's a very interesting vertical because uh, users really have this logic about context. So home context and work context. And they really like to manage, have like different profiles within their devices. And they expect them to behave differently based on where they are and what are they doing. So it's context awareness. It's, of course, a focus of this kind of, of deals. Thank you. If we can have Circular Device come up, which is a startup 
that is proving that sometimes it's good when your phone goes to pieces. Hello. Um, well, the pro, I'm the CEO of Circular Devices, and uh, I'm based. Uh, our company is based in Finland. And the problem we are solving is that there, we have 5.6 billion of adults going to have a smartphone quite soon. And as uh, Kilian Williams, the co-founder of iFixit, was uh, pointing out, we need better phones with a longer lifespan. So our solution, it's modular design, which is quite simple to understand. Just in the app, there is the electronics that can last up to 10 years unless you consider it's outdated, the screen that lasts up to 10 years unless you broke it, and the battery. So why to get rid of your car is the windshield breaks? Or in other words, this is a Nintendo system. You have the TV, the battery, and the cartridge. So the puzzle phone sets you free by design, and standard hardware also brings a standard firmware, which means that we will offer to the industry one firmware to rule them all. Um, the puzzle phone journey so far, uh, we have been going through different stages of uh, prototyping, um, and we also, uh, we aim to mass production by the end of, the, of this year. We have been running through different stages of, of funding, private funding, we are backed by the Finnish government also, and we are partnered with the Fraunhofer Institute from Berlin. Uh, we discovered just a few weeks ago that we are, that we are what they call uh, the full start, the full stock startup, so combined that we are 15, uh, persons in the team with more than 200 years of experience. Just uh, we announced, we disclosed uh, yesterday that Tapani Jokin, the former head of design of the product portfolio for Microsoft and Nokia, he is also with us. And we come from this industry. So that's, uh, this design uh, aims to fix many things within, within the industry. So why? It needs, uh, actual needs are not served by monolithic design. If you need different screen sizes or tailor-made things for your phone, the industry cannot offer those uh, fast enough. So for whom? For the ethical consumer, it's a serviceable device for developing countries. It's also a solution for OEM and ODM. You can hit the market faster with our solution. We are three times faster and cheaper to implement any chip coming from the market. And that's a big difference. Uh, our business model uh, contemplates uh, it can be integrated different ways. We will have our own manufacturing, but we can also license to operators and other brands. But also we can uh, develop local partnerships to uh, export the sustainable from a corporate social responsibility point of view manufacturing. So we aim to make it sustainable in Europe and then we will spread it across India, Americas and other countries. So, important, the device is not the product, it's the standard. It's designed, engineered, manufactured, and assembled in Europe. That makes a big difference. We have come so uh, we came too far to give up what we are. So Europe is the cradle, the democracy, and we have fight quite a lot for this actual uh, social welfare. So by proving that we can make it viable here, we will be able to export it instead of blindly outsourcing the things without thinking about the consequence. So it's a complete modular ecosystem. It's a complete modular ecosystem. It's a smartphone, it's a tablet, and yes, you can also build the Internet of Things ecosystem around it. Just like a baby monitoring system, using our brain and our batteries as a backup, it can be done. When? Closer than you think. We just pick up the first build from the oven Friday night. And by the way, they were manufacturing in Barcelona. Uh, there was one PCB missing that was supposed to come from Germany, but we lost the factory in December, bar burned to the ground, uh, Group of Electronics. Uh, but we are making to go it through. And well, uh, thank you. Kitos, moltes gracias, and paldis, as they say in Latvia. So, um, very honorable. I, I think I always appreciate when people try and take a different tack than something which is already a pretty established industry. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have this big conference here now. If you, anybody think back what Mobile World Conference was, Congress was, uh, just a few years back, how, how much it's been growing. Um, but you're assuming two things, right? You're assuming that fashion, uh, that it doesn't play a role in, in, in the buyers today of buying what phone they buy. And secondly, my question really is on the form factor. What is your, what's your take and what is your approach to changing form factors, and particularly in IoT and in variables over the next couple of years? Well, well uh, 
In terms of assuming, uh, at this point, we have received enough express of an interest uh, from uh, network operators and manufacturers and so forth and forth. So uh, I would say that we haven't figured out everything, but at least we seems to be work working in the right direction. And in terms of form factor, uh, yes, there is. A, you need to take a decision. So the smallest screen, for instance, it limits the biggest battery that you can you can include. But again, we believe that we are taking an, uh, the right decisions based on, on the expertise, the knowledge we have, and, and the procedure that we are following in, in our R&D path. You talked about that you had a modular ecosystem, right? And obviously your product's very modular, right? In design and form and, and the flexibility it provides. How is your product going to be able to really modulate the ecosystem beyond what you do today as different needs of IoT start to formulate? So how will you extend your product or extend your offering or extend your modular ecosystem to meet the upcoming demands of IoT? Well, uh, modularity by, by itself, it opens up an entire world of possibilities. So, for instance, if you replace the spine by the dock station, then you can include there a baby monitoring system, and you can use your old battery to, as a backup battery for that. So that's aligned with what uh, it's called a reuse cascade. So there is a long lifespan even from those outdated models. Just one example, for instance, a uh, few weeks ago we disclosed just it was a concept that if you have an old brain, you can collect those in one thing we call the puzzle cluster, it's like a toaster, and you can plug in the, your old brains and you, you can use it maybe for powering your um, multimedia center, for instance, but you can also stack more puzzle clusters and have more power. So for some uh, needs that kind of reuse, it's just enough and there is no need to manufacture something new for that especially when those things, they are made from very scarce materials and it's scientifically proven that the recyclable, it's not enough to capture the CO2 footprint. That's, for instance, one of the uh, hints and advices that we were receiving from, from the Fraunhofer Institute, that, hey guys, make it reusable, because that's the life, increased lifespan is, is the solution we need. So qu question about uh, question would have uh, in terms of uh, price point, uh, as you are not manufacturing most cheaply, uh, you will have compared to same feature set a higher price point most probably. Is there a um, research or guts feeling where you say uh, how much higher price point for same feature set is accepted for this uh, more uh, sustainable concept? Well, I, I'm not sure if I, I got the, the question right, sorry. Uh, I'm going low on sugar. <laughs> Maybe I rephrase it. Uh, if uh, a comparable phone uh, would, uh, from a Chinese manufacturer would cost uh, 250 yeah, and right. you want to reach the same feature set with a more sustainable, uh, different concept, uh, any idea what would be acceptable in the market uh, to pay as a premium for going a more green concept? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, Chinese manufacturers, they are not our enemies. Uh, in fact, we will like uh, and we will spread it to China. And the main reason is that uh, what we uh, have learned in our experience of sourcing to China is that the lack and the absence of a real hardware standard is harming the whole supply chain from the CMs up to the end users. So with our solution, the life will be so much easier. But also we want to spread this uh, good practices to them. And there is already companies like Fairphone, for instance, in Amsterdam, and the main sales point is uh, just on corporate social responsibility, and they have partnered with factories in China, and, well, they are not the cheapest ones, but it seems that there is at least enough customers to make it happen. So we are not aiming to be the next Apple or Samsung, which is happy to prove that it's viable to do the things in a better way. Uh, our next startup is Fuel Oil from the U.S., who say that their success will be measured by how much truck drivers hate them. Hi, everybody. My name is George Yuri Kamagosi, and I'm a co-founder of Fuel Oil Technology, a company that developed a solution to prevent fuel theft in trucking industry. The biggest expense of every trucking company is the fuel. Up to 35% of all money goes on fuel expenses. 
and every minute up to 1,000 US dollars of that fuel is being stolen worldwide. There's more than 10 million trucks driving around the world, leaving their company for up to 40 or 50 days, drivers carrying those credit cards in order to pay the fuel without any control. Damage is estimated on up to 1,700 US dollars per month per truck, and that, that has to be stopped. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a solution. The smartest fuel cap ever, Fuel Oil ICAP 1000. Once installed on a truck, Fuel Oil Smart Cap will measure, transmit, and store the amount of data of the fuel that went in. And due to a protection system, it will make sure that that fuel stayed in the, the fuel tank. It also has uh, an alarm, so if an unauthorized removal occurs, it will inform the company headquarters that somebody removed the fuel cap. It also has a built-in 3G modem that will support it by a SIM card, send the information to the cloud so the companies have real-time access to the data. Our competitor, even though there is a lot of competition in our area, nobody, none of them approach to the solution like we did. All of them are requiring some sort of connection to the vehicle in order to have power or in order to send the data. And they're also requesting some trunk uh, uh, fuel tank modifications since they're not allowed to do uh, due to warranty issues. So that's what makes us a good choice. We can provide a do-it-yourself installation. Anybody can install it in just 30 seconds. There's no drilling. There's no fuel tank modification, no connection to the vehicle power. OBD CAN bus system, it's a completely standalone device supported with battery ensuring two years of life. And the measurement, we have more than 99% accuracy of a measurement. Our business model is that we are giving devices for free, and the clients are only paying for the service as a monthly fee, all tied up with the contracts for the 36 months, which makes us to have around 1,700 US dollars income per vehicle per contract at an 85% gross margins. So, so far, we have a working prototype, 350K worth of pre-orders, distributor agreement signed with one large truck leasing company in the US and a patent in place. So our team consists on a highly skilled individuals with huge experience in developing software and hardware companies, backed up by, by our advisor team, experienced in developing uh, GPS and fleet management companies, also with a huge experience in the trucking business, which makes us to believe that we are ready to deliver one more success story. And we would like to invite all the interested parties to join us on this most profitable drive. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. From a business perspective, I'm curious, how are you guys thinking about the financing piece when you're giving away these devices up front and the revenue comes much later, if at all? Um, what, have, what feedback have you received from investors and how are you thinking about funding this? Uh, basically, we are subscription based, so clients are paying a monthly fee, which we are charging for six months in advance upon the signing of the contract. And since we have some really good gross margins and really nice markup, that's more than enough to cover all the expenses. Now that you just told us your gross markup, um, I would, you know, if, if I'm a logistics and I own a company in the States driving trucks, I would say, you know, let's renegotiate that price. How are you going to approach that issue? Because okay. I have very, very low margins in logistics. Okay, so you just gave me a way of earning 85%. Uh, yeah, so basically, since uh, we're I'll give using. You a deal for everyone in the room that heard the markup, we'll give you a deal. <laughs> Yeah, so basically every truck needs two devices since they have two fuel tanks. So users get two uh, smart fuel caps. He's paying a monthly subscription fee of $49, all tied up with the contract. And uh, since we only charge in six months in advance and then month after month, uh, the money we charge for six months in advance is more than enough to cover all the expenses. So we're basically happy with the markups. <laughs> to that, like I like that your hardware is free because that, that's really in a trucking fleet, that's really a kind of table stakes. 
But have you thought about maybe when to get out of what you talked about, right, in the future as you grow and expand, you're saving them money. And if even if you save them 1%, that's a lot of money for them. You might want to think about shifting your business model to percent savings. So you're getting out of this prescription negotiation because they will t negotiate the shirt off of you. I, we know this, a lot of us that have played in the fleet and automotive industry. I have since 1985. So I would just say you might want to think about, you know, once you kind of establish an extension that is more about what value do you create together, mm -hmm. right? And then making your money off of that. And I think it would be more than paying for yourself. Yes, I completely agree. And in the phase two, we are uh, preparing to launch some sort of special service that will make uh, our clients happy and allow them to uh, make even more money. And we are uh, developing some sort of revenue share uh, model that will uh, enable us to generate more money from the existing clients and to generate more money for them. So basically, at the end, they will make money by using our service. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Hanha from uh, London. And uh, they're trying to solve one of the most basic issues around one of the most common things out there. Hello, everybody. My name is Azir Hussain. I'm uh, from Hanha. Uh, the pro uh, problem we're going after, and our product, sorry, is Pass of Life. Uh, the product we're going after, the opportunity we're uh, aiming for, is really the e-commerce market, the story of our age really, but specifically within that parcels, packages that, that are really the backbone of that. The 20 billion parcels in Euro Europe for 2020, interestingly half of those is the UK and Germany and that really represents our launch markets. The key takeaway from this slide is that if you're going to go whale hunting, you want to find a deep ocean and that's really the main point of this. We're going after something big we hope. What are the challenges? The key question you ask, where, where is my stuff? Actually, what you're really asking is, how do I plan my day? How do I organize myself so I can be in the right place to catch what I need to benefit from not only getting the parcel, then benefiting from the use of the product that I've got shipped? This is a big problem. Um, interestingly enough, though, you know, 45 years ago, we managed to put a man on the moon, and we got him back, or them back, without delays, losses, or damages, yet we're not able to do that with our parcels. It's a very complex problem to solve. And of course, you have customer unhappiness. Um, anybody knows uh, running a business, acquisition costs are very high. Just uh, look at the cost of an MWC pass. And uh, you add that to when things go wrong, you're dealing with retention costs. You have acquisition and retention, so you're doubling down on everything. So we thought about this. And we've been thinking about why not make the parcel self-aware? Move the concept of awareness from the network into the actual parcel itself. Think about what that opens up for us. You can mix shippers now. You can take out the human element. You can have a direct relationship with your parcel. There's a lot of tracking solutions out there, of course. Uh, you know, if you're uh, Maersk or whatever, you have big containers, you're doing all of that. But those are industrial solutions. How do we deliver a consumer-grade experience? And that's really a combination of technology and business model, which we'll come on to. And that really comes to our value. What is our engagement value? It's the capability and uh, the low price all combined into a really easy to use proposition. So the device comes in a package first. So it looks a little bit like this, the actual package concept. And essentially the way it works is if you're an e-retailer of something, you can throw this into the parcel. This is in, inside the parcel with your goods. Uh, essentially once it's in there, you're now tracking. Wherever it goes in the world, it has its own quad band GSM. It's independent of the network that it's in. Uh, you track it through a variety of mechanisms, and we'll come on to that, but obviously online, et cetera, et cetera. And the innovation is that at the end of the concept, when the parcel arrives at the um, receiver, all they have to do is they press a button and an address appears on the, on the package itself, and you post that back. And that's the end of the return concept. So what does the device look like? Well, it looks like this. It looks like these. They're about credit card size. Uh, we're tracking five different attributes of a parcel. We're tracking location. We're tracking motion. In other words, has the parcel been dropped or subject to any kind of extreme shock? 
Um, security, has the package been opened? Uh, we're tracking temperature, if it's been left in a hot or cold space, and humidity, has it been left out in the, in the wet? Uh, we give you a dashboard that gives you a kind of air traffic control view of the parcel, and also, interestingly, gives you the ability to have alerts, has a parcel moved, not moved, has it been opened, and so on and so forth. So you're getting exception reports of your, uh, of your proposition. We, have, we give you one view of your parcel. We, we have two variants of our product. We have a B2B product, uh, which is an IP-rated device. Uh, comes with GPS, of course. And then we have a consumer product, which we call Parcel Live. And essentially, that's the device we're talking about, which comes in a package. But the back end is the same. It's the same infrastructure, same business model, same, uh, let's say, engagement model with the, with the customer. The innovation here is that they, for the geeks among us, you get a single data queue for analytics, OLAP purposes, for end to end, from your supply to your customer. Total view of your transportation. So who are we targeting? Uh, well, of course, e-commerce retailers. Um, another really interesting market for us has been the national postal carriers. These guys in particular, you know, they're heavily embedded socially and politically. They have a, a huge employment issues, ch challenges to really change uh, and bring innovation into their network. And the margins they currently have on parcel shipping is very low. So here now we have a very rich margin product with no capex for them to now offer global track and trace of parcels. Of course, we're not, another application we're talking about is supply chain uh, management. In particular, we've been looking at uh, security of product, and these are for high value items like perfumes, alcohol, uh, pharma uh, is an interesting market where you can now embed one of our devices into the package and track its security throughout the entire journey, which includes moving outside of your own network, so even with third party retailers. So, what's our traction uh, to date? Well, we've got uh, customer trials. One of our main uh, Supporters of this has been uh, Deutsche Telekom or Telekom Deutschland. Uh, through them, we've done two things. One, they themselves are looking to trial this. Telecom itself ships 40,000 parcels per day uh, for their own customers. So we'll, they'll be using our product internally. Uh, but also through their sales force, we're acting some of their key accounts uh, to demonstrate this in, in, and to create our own case studies. Um, we also have a very good relationship with uh, Airtel, uh, who've allowed us the ability to um, implement a USSD server within their network. And for those of you that know that, uh, it means we get our own GSM point code, which is a very, very big thing in terms of how we price our comms. Uh, so that's now also within our ability to do. Uh, we've uh, secured our global fulfillment with a company called Arvato, Arvato which is part of the Bertelsmann Group. It now means that when you press a button here and the address comes up, we have one of 40 locations in the world where the device is posted back to. Um, our investment is that we've now secured our seed investor, who's right here in the front, and uh, he's now committed to move forward with a portion of our next round, and we're looking to, looking to gather that. And what's our, you know, we're going to end up wherever we're, wherever we're going to be, but, but the key thing is that, you know, we're not Captain Ahab. We need partners. We, we need employees, engineers, anybody in our data space. So if you are engineers or experts, if you are uh, investors, if you are stakeholders who have a real pain point that we can solve for you, please come uh, engage with us on Twitter. Uh, that's uh, connecting you to your world, CY2YW, or uh, on LinkedIn at uh, Hanha. We promise not to waste your time, and it'll be very fulfilling and engaging and helpful for all of us. And almost on time, uh, we're Parcel Live, and we're Hanha. Thank you very much. I have a question for you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, who owns the data, the customers or you? Well, if it, it's not a question we've been asked, actually. So the, we are happy to share the data with our customer. I mean, the, the data is also with us, but of course we can share it with our customers as part of their data analytics to improve their processes, yes? Share it or own it? That's an interesting question I think we need to take offline. But at this point, there's not been a data um, acquisition issue. But where there's a legal issue, of course, we'll comply with that.
Uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, what about the pricing model? So the pricing model is, it's very crucial that the device is not owned by the customer. The device is always owned by us. The whole proposition is a hardware as a service. Um, we call it a kind of a flush and forget engagement model. You come in with a burden, we leave satisfied. The, the, the key thing is that uh, the way it works is the companies pay on a per track basis. So they have a subscription. They, they subscribe to a monthly number of, uh, let's say, journeys. When the device reaches its destination, it comes back to us. As soon as it hits one of our global points, the, the retailer gets a new device issued to them in package. So th this device doesn't go back to the retailer. And what happens is this device then gets circulated into its local market. It's a little bit like um, if you're a rental car organization, you know, a car moves from location to location, and then each location rotates it in its own thing. The key thing is that the ownership in terms of liability, management, charging, all of that is excluded. There's no capex for the retailer. They simply take it on. So if they decide today they want to use it, we can be online within a week. There's no new manpower issues, no new infrastructure for them to take on. They just take it, use it, and they're away. Have you thought about other interesting uses for the device? I mean, you're, you're tracking the end-to-end -end and the real-time um, curse of the, of the parcel, but what else can you do with the data? Like, uh, what, how do people want to interact with the data? Partnerships uh, to help you sort of uh, create more of an experience for the user rather than, the one, uh, rather than watching paint dry. You know, our ultimate vision is that this whole concept of giving people the location of their parcel is a bit of a waste of time. Frankly speaking, if I'm shipping a parcel from Barcelona to Birmingham, the fact that it's going via Belgrade is not really useful information to me. What the experience we want to reach to, ultimately, is that when you buy a parcel, when you buy a product, we'd like you to get a countdown timer. And when that timer hits zero, there's a knock on your door. That's what we want to get to. It has to be that easy. Forget about all this on a truck, off a truck, on a plane. And to get to that experience, the first step in that journey is the enablement of engaging with the parcel. So you can take out a lot of these other issues. And then once you have that, you now, as a system, we're tracking its journey. We can now start overlaying other data analytics there, traffic, weather, delays. We can start adjusting this clock in real time. The key thing is that the end user, who's not a logistics specialist who we shouldn't expect to be special in geography or anything else, can just manage and have one single indicator to say, this is my day, and when this clock hits zero, my door will ring, and that's where we're trying to get to. Hello. Yeah, these functionalities that you mentioned, uh, sense of temperature and light and so forth, uh, is everything included, or do you have like a, how do you price the, these services? So there's two parts to that question. Um, from a hardware perspective, everything's included. Um, a key efficiency in this is on our side, our supply chain has to be super simple. So we cannot afford really to have uh, multiple variants of our device. We currently only have two variants. And our focus is just to have two variants, one for the B2B, one for the B2C. And that's it. The second question you ask about how we price the data by value, that's an interesting question. I think we need to explore that but it could be that 90% of people want location, but the people who have goods which do require environmental management think there is a higher value point for them, and I think this needs to be explored how we do that. So one question, um, as many as the uh, Internet of Things play, the, the value is in the data. Uh, any ideas who could be additional beneficiary of the data, new customer sets like insurances or whatever, where can uh, drive value? So insurance is somebody we actually are engaged with right now. Insurance is a very interesting model. You, you, when, from an insurance company, they hate claims. It's their number one hit on margin. So you have a premium, 10% goes to head office costs, 10, 15% goes to their reserve, and the rest is really just their money, unless somebody makes a claim. So if they have an ability to enforce a policy where people have to use a device like this, which is independent of the carrier, so now they can validate, is the device being lost? If it was dropped, who dropped it? Because the liability issue now becomes significant. Um, if it was damaged, where was it damaged? All this stuff an insurance company can use to effectively manage their claims process, there's a huge turn for them. So they're one uh, industry we really are engaged with. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, next up, we'd like to bring up Sentience, which is from Belgium, who before mentioned that they're almost as passionate about their startup as they are about waffles. All right, so thanks for having me. Uh, we're Sentience. We are a Belgium venture capital-backed uh, company. We just closed a Series A, uh, two million round, uh, just in January, and things are moving pretty fast. Uh, we are, uh, just last two weeks, we hired three uh, top talents in the fields also of deep learning, but also business development, opened an office in Singapore. And if things go to plan, we would be servicing uh, a couple of millions of daily active users by next year. Um, what the, we've seen the opportunity, and by 2020, over one trillion of sensors will interconnect our lives globally through smartphones, wearables, uh, homes, cars, and, and whatnot. And if these sensors are the equivalent of the eyes and the ears of the internet, then basically our company, Sentience, wants to be the brain behind this. And this is exactly what we're doing. Our technology comes as a mobile software development kit that can be integrated into mobile applications or or even deeper integrations into embedded and operating systems that is capable to sense and understand, but also, and this is quite important, predict um, context, mood, and behavior of uh, human beings. And um, okay, so this this happens by looking at the sensors and unlocking these into rich contextual mobile experiences. These are given back to developers and companies out there at two layers. The first layer is contextual awareness, right? And this goes way beyond geofencing. For example, this uh, the couple of use cases that we have um, in the media uh, industry. For example, when a telco knows what movies you're looking at, we know or our algorithms know what the circumstances are you're looking at that movie at that movie, for example, whether or not you're alone in the room or with your kid in a room or with other people, whatever. This is all contextual information that is useful. And this is one of the reasons why we closed the first alliance with a, co a company called Empress TV, in which we're currently rolling out contextware recommender systems. A second layer is what we call behavioral profiling. And these are kind of profiles that are very distinct from Google or Facebook profiles in the sense that it, we learn this through observed behavior, not so much of self-declared data. Um, specific use cases are mainly now we're getting traction in the insurance industry where we offer driver centric UBI uh, integrations. So basically, insurance companies know based on your driving behavior that it learns through our system to reward you with premiums and discounts. This provides you with rich real time and contextualized profiles, such as this man on, on, on the picture. Obviously, we heavily rely and invest in deep learning resources. Hard to get by talents, but we are proud to say that we are recruiting a lot of top talent uh, PhD. And, but this is also provided back to our SDK, easy to integrate with one line of code, both on Android and iOS. And obviously, battery drain is an important issue for us. We have been optimizing on this so that basically you can go on a single charge on a day um, for applications that are running our software development kit. Not only this, we also developed a self-service portal, which will be launched in April, 1st of April, not a joke, swear to God, um, which actually allows and empowers uh, less, you know, less technically inclined people out there to start building not only campaigns, but we call them like serendipitous experiences, where our technology is actually capable of anticipating certain actions or certain behavioral patterns that our mobile users are exposing. And this is just one very simple example of how you know, modern day and next generation mobile experiences can be built using our software. And in terms of business, before we close down, uh, we are currently have uh, traction in custom growing customer base in the insurance, mobility and healthcare industry, also in the media, uh, telco providers. Our SDK will be launched on the 1st of April. Currently, this is only uh, distributed privately to our um, clients. I'm sorry. And while we are still keeping our North Star in the mobile advertising industry, which we're looking for friendly partners to launch with, um, we are currently in talks with the largest man handset manufacturers and system integrators to learn how our technology can be integrated into operating systems and even some parts of our classifiers into chipsets. And I just want to thank you for uh, your attention. I'd gladly take some questions.
So are you already in conversations with some of the, hand um, the manufacturers of handsets? Yes, we are. <laughs> I mean, that was easy. But I mean, <laughs> that was I, I easy. Want, you can be yes to one. Is it, is, it, is it significant sizing? It's or? a significant sizing and there are multiple um, okay. parties that we're currently talking is to and exploring, actively exploring. The follow-up to that is it wasn't clear to me what the hand fat manufacturer gets out of you being that middle layer. Well, it, it, what we get out of is every handset manufacturer has understood that the success of their handsets is largely depending on the, on the rich mobile app ecosystem, including contextual aware technology inside of an operating system on mobile handsets. Uh, but not only mobile, by the way, but on mobile handsets would provide this kind of technology and this power to millions of developers out there, which would in, in turn, in, you know, um, again, generate a couple of mobile applications, a new generation of mobile applications that are much more contextually aware, which means that basically the whole mobile experience becomes more silent. I mean, right now, you know, we're bombarded with push notifications and, and they come at the most irrelevant moments. This kind of technology can make sure that, you know, these notifications or any other type of user experience comes to you only at the moment that you need it most. So it's, it's more of an anticipatory experience that we can generate. Thanks for the presentation. Um, how do you guys think about privacy? Mm -hmm. And would I be able to tell what tags you apply to me? Like, would someone be happy to learn that they're an aggressive driver, you know, or <laughs> alone? Very good question. Um, the, the easy answer basically is um, on a legal and technical uh, level, we do comply with the European laws and bylaws in terms of data protection and privacy. This is, you know, the, the fast answer. The longer answer would be that we also work, to, we heavily emphasize and influence our clients that we work with also to, in order to um, use this kind of technology, there needs to be an adequate amount of added value being provided back to the end, end client. Uh, said that part of our uh, portal that we're also going to launch will consist of a uh, personal data store that would allow end users to, you know, manage their, uh, their, uh, their own data as well. If you have enough data, you would see yourself being like a, a DMP or a tick in the DSP where people can say like, I want to profile. I want to bid on this ad because I know that this person is a dog owner and alone. Currently, we are, um, and this is very well, uh, this might very well be our future. Currently, we're interfacing to DMPs to enrich uh, the profiles with our data, but uh, this could very well be our future indeed, yes. I guess just um, there's a couple ways to look at it from a privacy. I want to follow back up on that. It's either opt in or opt out. It right? is an opt in. It's an yeah. opt in. Yeah. And then have you thought about, since you have this large amount of data, have you thought about monetization of the data itself to various communities? Uh, currently, this is on the table. We're not actively doing this uh, because we also, apart from the privacy, we also want to act in an ethically, a moral, uh, responsible manner with this data. So this is definitely not something that, that we're going to pursue this year. Uh, however, we're looking at it for a, for a future. Yeah. All right. Great. We have our second to last startup, which is Undergrid, which as far as I can tell is trying to connect everything. Let's have a look. Good afternoon. My name is Rolf. I'm CEO at Undergrid. And like most of us, I traveled uh, from far. I came from Amsterdam. And maybe you traveled into a Barcelona airport, and if you arrived and you looked outside, well, your plane was still at the gate. Maybe you've noticed many trailers carrying luggage. Amsterdam Airport alone has over 8,000 of those trailers, of which they need to know their use and location to fulfill contract and maintenance commitments. But they don't have that information. And you cannot use Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cellular because that requires infrastructure, regular charging of batteries, configuration, or is simply too costly, let alone all the other aspects with those technologies. 
Undergrad has proven to deliver the solution. And I'm very proud that an executive of Amsterdam Airport flew in, came here today to listen to our story and support our business. Let's have a look. Our mm. There it is. Our solution consists of three parts. First, unique patented communication software empowering devices to connect to one another, organically forming a network without any configuration or infrastructure. And the network can work for years on one single battery. Two, a cloud architecture for storage and analysis of data with open APIs to integrate with, for instance, Salesforce or SAP. And three, products, and I brought it here, as we now sell in the aviation industry. Products that are very simple, and the only thing a customer has to do is to attach it to an asset, and it works. And as we provide valuable information that wasn't available before, customers like Schiphol, and also now starting at Paris Charles de Gaulle, are paying us for years per trailer and embrace our approach. And this is, however, not a track and trace only concept. This is not our end game. Third parties are already asking us to integrate our technology in their own products. And that's exactly the goal of our ecosystem strategy. Because we want to empower others to use our technology in many different industries. And leading companies in, for instance, the oil and gas industry or agriculture want to get data. Data for optimizing logistics in offshore or data on temperature, humidity, solar radiation to get better crop yield everywhere in the world. And our vision, it's not, sorry. And our vision and business approach has been recognized by many. We've been founded only one year ago and we've been awarded as the best Internet of Things ID in Europe and Dutch Startup of the Year last year. And four years from now, the Internet of Things will have grown tremendously and we will be a leading contributor to this growth. Many speak about the Internet of Things, but our team, with over 40 years' experience in this industry, put words into action. For Undergrid, no hype, but real business. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks. So you mentioned integrating your technology. How would you go about doing that? Can you give an example or two? Sorry. You mentioned integrating your technology. Yeah. Could you give me an example or two of how, how you do? What who would you do that with and how? What we have is a... What we have is a communication protocol, software. So it's easy to get uh, the communication protocol to connect the devices to each other. So we don't have to uh, manufacture the device by our own. Uh, anybody can use the communication protocol. And uh, with the backup of the cloud system, uh, you can get the information out of the network. Is that answering your question? Yes. OK. So question I would have about the revenue model. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, how that scales and uh, where the inflection points are, where it, where it charge? Uh, currently, our business model is based on three parts. It's, uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, sell uh, the product uh, uh, income, recurring revenue per device. So we charge a customer. Uh, it's, it's without communication costs, but we charge a customer for the use of the APIs in the cloud system. And the third part is, uh, and that's also very nice, uh, the pr uh, former presenter, uh, we have to partner up, um, is the analysis of the data. So we get, other inf we get data from uh, sources where there was no information before. So we can charge customers for that. And then in the future, we will license the technology. And uh, what we see is also uh, local network intelligence will be a big part in the next uh, years. 
follow-on question. Um, as you're creating this uh, connectivity thing, uh, would it be also kind of shielded to uh, transport other data than the primary use case? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you very can, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Fantastic, yeah. well done. Great, we're getting close to the end here. Our last startup is Visual Lead from Israel, which as far as I can tell, got paid about $10 million recently to learn Chinese. video doesn't work, so they're fixing it. Everybody still awake? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Minor technical, whoa. There's a technical issue. Uh, minor technical issue. We'll be right back. Okay, so full YFN doesn't support videos in uh, presentations just yet, so uh, you'll have to believe me that there are some videos up there. So let me tell you about us. So China is the world's largest mobile internet market. And in China, the sexiest segment of Internet of Things is called O2O, offline to online. O2O deals with bridging the gap between the physical world and the digital world. It's the mobile interaction of people with things, such as getting information on products in store or paying for movie tickets. The most popular technology for O2O worldwide is QR codes. Some people mistakenly believe that QR codes are a thing of the past, but anyone who's been to Asia or noticed what leading companies worldwide are doing understands that QR codes are becoming mainstream. But there's a problem with QR codes that hinders their adoption. They're ugly and meaningless to people. Only machines can read them. So designers push them to the corner and people don't scan them enough. Visual Lead fixes the user experience of QR codes. We developed patented technology based on our team's deep expertise in computer vision that turns any image, animation, and even video into an engaging visual QR code, which you can't see here because the videos don't work. <laughs> but with those videos, and I'm so sorry that you can't experience it. Maybe we'll show you later. Um, with the visual uh, call to action and the visual within the QR code, people understand QR codes. So brands can make their code stand out. People are intrigued by the visual call to action. And as a result, consumers are scanning our codes up to four times more than regular black and white QR codes. We also secure mobile interactions. So it's not only beautiful, it's also secure. So an example would be packaging. You mentioned packaging. So we, we support anti-counterfeit. We help brands protect their products against counterfeiting. Imagine yourself 
scanning a product or a package to find out instantly if it's real or fake. And the reason we can do it is because we know how to make QR codes even more secure than they are using our proprietary technology. We also power mobile ticketing without paper. And we secure mobile payments, creating codes that hackers cannot break. And powering all these interactions, all these transactions, actually means big data. Our technology does to QR codes what color TVs did to black and white television, what smartphones did to feature phones. It transforms the O2O industry. Today we serve over 500,000 businesses on our web platform, including Coca-Cola, Orange, and BMW. Our API lets developers and enterprises generate millions of visual QR codes for their applications. And you can try to for free on our website, visualead.com. And last year, we entered China. We opened an office in Shanghai. Two of our founders relocated with their families to Shanghai. And within a year, two of China's leading social networks integrated our technology. In January, we announced a strategic investment from the Alibaba Group, the world's largest e-commerce player, who's also going to deploy our technology across their platforms. So now we focus on bringing the O2O revolution to the West and developing new technologies to power mobile interactions between people and things. We're visual lead. That's a video. <laughs> And we connect offline and online with visual QR codes and mobile innovation. Thank you. We have time for one question, actually. Some companies got here 15 minutes. So uh, can you print it on any substrate that you would be able to print an ordinary QR code on? Or do you have any limitations to your? Again, again. Sorry? I couldn't hear. Oh, can you print it on any substrate yes. that you would uh, be able to do with an ordinary QR code? Definitely. So QR codes, one of the reasons that they're popular is that they're so cheap to produce in mass production. And our QR codes can be printed by regular printers. They can be printed, you know, by, uh, they can be broadcasted on TVs and digital out of home. They can be even wearable technology. You see? So... So yes, uh, first of all, you can print them anywhere, but more importantly, what's our magic is that with any QR code scanner, you can scan our codes and we don't need to integrate it anywhere. So regular QR codes, whatever you're using, can scan our codes on a t-shirt or on a paper or on TV, and it will get the, the data and the code within that uh, visual QR code. That's fantastic. Lots more questions, I'm sure, here. I'd encourage you to find him in the audience afterwards to watch the videos that we missed out on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And visit our booth. We have a proper video station demonstrating our technology. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we're heading into a lightning round right now of voting. Um, we will, uh, the judges will go vote. Every one of you will be able to vote through the URL up there. I encourage you all to get your phones out and go there now, and we'll be back with you in a few minutes and announce the winners. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. So um, we're a couple minutes over, so this last part will take about three minutes or so while the judges uh, crunch the number in a super big data computer. Just kidding. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, please go ahead. Uh, we're going to have audience uh, tally real quick. The, um, that's going to show up right here. And uh, in the meanwhile, we'll also have a quick um, uh, announcement from our, from our partner and sponsor from Aquology. They also have a dome over there uh, with their name on it. It's pretty cool. So uh, go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are very uh, happy and excited to sponsor uh, this competition. Aquology uh, is a company from the same corporation that owns the water company of Barcelona. So we are, we are playing home, and we are very happy to have you all here, not only to rely on football, to have interesting things. Um, Aqualogy is a, it's a company that delivers services and technology for the water industry. Uh, the water industry uh, and the water in general 
it's going to be clearly affected by Internet of Things and digital, and digital economy. Uh, we see this in three main areas. The way we manage uh, our assets, the amount of information that we will get from them, the amount of information that we will give to our field workers to, to manage them. The second part will be the way we interact with uh, cities and all the other uh, services. And the third part, the way we interact with our consumers. For this, we, we just created our first startup, Oasis, which is present on the startup book um, uh, area. You can see it. So we, we mainly uh, promote this in three ways. First of all, creating our own uh, projects uh, to develop these technologies. Uh, to be at the forefront of, of the industry. Second part, we have our venture area to invest in existing startups. But also the third part, and which is the one that is quite creative, it's to put our challenges in hands of entrepreneurs and startups that are able to develop and adapt their products and receive funding uh, to go uh, further. Uh, nothing else to add. Thank you to everybody and, and have a happy stay. Fantastic. We'll have the winners in a moment. They're uh, conferring over there. Looks like there's some horse trading going on. No money changing hands. That's good. Fantastic. I think we have a decision. So, ask all the startups to come up. Sure. Can all the startups please come up to the stage? <laughs> well, whatever. Make Let's give a big hand of applause for everybody. That's a great idea. All right, are you guys ready for this? Yeah? Okay, so the, the runner-up for the ILT four years from now award is Fuel Loyal. Congratulations. Wait, do you have a sign somewhere? Okay. All right, and the winner for the ILT track for four years from now award 2015 is? I'll let you take this one, Mike. You okay. did a great job here. Let's do this. So I can't really tell. It's kind of... Close. It's Hannah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank thank you very much for the. Let me see. If we can get the audience thing in here. It's okay. We will email you who the audience choice is because it's kind of not loading. But um, thank you very much for participating. Um, it's been a great 90 minutes. We'll be back here tomorrow for the, our last and final edition. And uh, the judges will be around if you have some questions and definitely come and mingle with the startup. They've been working very hard for the past couple weeks. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, judges. Thank you, startups. And thank you, everybody, for coming.